it's the weekend, you know what that means. Time to fire up Unreal Engine 4 and build a game. As a quick heads up, today's lesson is gonna be a little bit denser than the past few. I'm trying to give you a crash course, not just in UE4, but also in some basic software engineering concepts at the same time. I went into serious debt at an engineering school so that you don't have to. But geez, if you can stick with me through this video, you're gonna have learned so much stuff. Today, we are gonna be building a door using UE4 Blueprint. It may not sound exciting, but doors are a really fundamental thing that you build in a lot of video games, and they will teach you a bunch of common concepts that I think are highly reusable to anything else you might wanna make with Blueprints in the future. Okay, what are Blueprints? The million dollar question. At their core, Blueprints are Unreal Engine 4's method of writing nearly all game logic that you might want to have in your game, unless you are planning to write that logic in C++, which we are not covering in this tutorial series. Nearly anything that you might want to build in your video game, having your character walk around and jump on stuff, building a fishing mini game, shooting a gun, climbing walls, all of that can be done with Blueprint, and even, yes, opening up a door. In UE4, there are two different types of Blueprints, Level Blueprints and Blueprint Classes. We're not gonna learn about Level Blueprints in this tutorial series because they're a little bit of a carryover from Unreal Engine 3 and they're not as widely used, but Blueprint Classes are how you can script basically anything that you would wanna do in your game. When all is said and done, the door that we're building today is gonna look like this. It's basically a generic door from any sci-fi video game that you've ever played. It just has a centerpiece that slides up when the player gets near, and then it slides down to close itself after them. But first, I need to teach you about the difference between classes and instances of a blueprint. Classes are, once again, a really fundamental concept that are used in a lot of object-oriented programming languages. And if you learn about classes here, you can apply the same basic knowledge to nearly any programming language that you learn in the future. To get technical for a second, classes are a way in any object-oriented programming language that you can define a set of characteristics that's true for some large number of objects and then basically group them together under one common label. I like to explain it this way. Let's pretend that we're making a video game about owning a pet where you can have a pet dog or a pet cat. Uh, if you wanted to create a class to define what a pet is, for the pet class, you might give it some common characteristics that are true of all pets that you have in your game. For example, all pets have four legs, all pets are fluffy, all pets have a nose, all pets have a tail, all pets have paws. Maybe pets also have some common functions that we can call, like walk around or eat food or drink water. If we're going to be building a game with thousands of different types of pets in it, maybe it's useful that all of those pets have access to some shared library of common functionality that they can use at any time. So then let's say you want to build out the cat system. Um, you can start by taking that pet class that you just defined, and then from it, you're going to create a cat class that inherits from the parent pet class and uh, give it some unique cat characteristics. Maybe the cat class even takes some of the functionality of that parent pet class and changes some of it to be more specific to what the cat class should do as a whole. For example, maybe the pet class has a function called sleep and that sleep function says, every 24 hours, this pet should sleep for about eight of those hours. Maybe then the cat class takes that sleep function and says, yes, in addition to this behavior, I would also like to stipulate that I will only sleep in places that are up high or places that are in a patch of sunlight. But because the cat class inherits from the parent pet class, we get all the properties of the pet class for free at the cat layer. But a class is just a template. It's theoretical. It exists in your code, but not necessarily in your game world. The second that we actually spawn something from a class, the thing that we spawn is called an instance. But no matter what happens to instances in your game world, their class defines those common properties about them. So if, for example, I were to suddenly decide, well, actually cats have two tails and I'm going to change the cat class so that it has two tails. Uh, every cat instance in the world would suddenly have two tails as well. It's worth noting that we're moving pretty fast here. So if any of this is confusing or doesn't make sense, I'll list some additional resources under the video that helped me when I was learning. So today what we're going to do is build that door class, and then we're gonna spawn an instance of that door. Let's get started. All right, to get started, let's get our level open from last time. Um, in order to create a door, uh, we're gonna right click down here in our content browser, and we're gonna create a new basic asset, and we're going to create a blueprint class. So the first thing you'll see is 
to pick a parent class. So as we just described, um, there's this concept that thing classes can inherit from other classes and they take on the properties of whatever that class is. So a lot of these are classes that you might want to use for various aspects of your game. We will be going into these in future tutorials, but today what we're going to do is create a blueprint class that derives or inherits from actor. Actor is the most basic class in Unreal Engine 4 when it comes to gameplay logic. Um, nearly anything in the world is an actor if it has any amount of logic on it. Uh, actor is a very vanilla class. There's a, not a lot going on here. It's kind of a nice blank slate, um, but it gives you a bunch of really helpful uh, sort of functions and things you might want to do from the get-go. So we're going to create an actor class and we're going to name that door. So you're going to see this new door blueprint appear down here. Um, and now we are going to double click it to open up the class and start editing the properties of that class. So as you can see, it's pretty blank. There's not a lot going on. I think they throw this helpful little like uh, white sphere in here for you, just so you can tell where the like zero zero position of the door is in world space if you were to start like adding geometry onto it. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do in a second here. So the next thing you need to know is that blueprints are kind of like mullets. So a mullet is business in the front, party in the back. A blueprint is components in the front, noodles in the back. And noodles, I, as I like to call them, or uh, nodes, which you can build through the event graph, uh, are how you actually script the logic that is attached to this blueprint. So the blueprint can have a bunch of components, which could be things like meshes, lights, textures, materials, all kinds of visual things, um, as well as actual like script components, which is an advanced topic that we'll go into later. But how you actually use those components and those things like textures, materials, meshes, whatever, and actually uh, perform logic actions on them, uh, you're actually going to do that in the event graph. So whenever you go to your blueprint, um, you can actually exit the, the event graph up here in this tab, or you can also go down here uh, down to graphs. Uh, it might be unfolded, it might not be, um, and double click here on the event graph. And you should be able to click any of the events in here to also get to the event graph. Uh, and the event graph is where uh, we're going to go once we've actually set up the visuals for our door and we've actually created those components that we're going to work with. So to get started, let's go back to the viewport. Again, the viewport is how you actually look at the visual of what your blueprint is going to be and where you actually can see all of these components and see where they're attached and configured. Um, it's the business part of the mullet. So we're going here and I, up here, we're going to add a new component. So real quick, we're going to step back. What is a component? A component is uh, basically a piece of prepackaged logic that you can just slot into your blueprint uh, for free. And so you can think of it a little bit like Legos. Uh, basically, a component is a Lego. So you might say, OK, well, I, you know, I, I would like to build a health component. And that health component has some properties like it comes with a health bar. Uh, it knows when the thing that it's attached to has been hit and has taken damage. It knows when the thing it's attached to has been killed and it can report like a death event. Um, so that health bar component is actually like a little Lego piece of logic that we can just slot onto anything that we would want to attach it to. Uh, in this case, we're actually looking for something much more fundamental than that. We are going to go in here and we're going to pick a cube which is something that we should be familiar with from our white boxing earlier. Um, this cube is actually a component. It's a component that's called a mesh component. Um, a mesh is basically just a shape in the world, a 3D shape. So we are going to create one of these mesh components. We're going to name it uh, inner door piece, just so we know what it is. It's really nice to name your components, helps you a lot later when you are confused and have a million of them and don't know which ones are which, uh, and hit enter. So now we're going to make the inner part of our door. This is going to be the part that slides up and down when the player gets close. So we're going to want to probably try and squash and stretch this a little bit, make it roughly door shaped. Um, let's drag it up. So by the way, this little grid that you're looking at, this is like your floor. This is where the floor will be for this object. So we probably want the sliding door to, you know, touch the floor, but not be sticking halfway through the floor. So we're going to just make sure that it sits uh, on top of that floor mesh. Uh, so next, let's give it a color so that it's pretty clear what 
this inner piece is compared to the rest of the door, which may uh, have a different appearance. So we're going to go um, and I'm going to teach you a new shortcut. Uh, if you go over here to the materials right here, we're actually just going to copy this material and we're going to make like a different color version of it for the inner piece. So if you click this little spy glass, magnifying glass, that's what magnifying glass uh, under any field that you see over here on the details panel, that's the find button. It will find that thing for you in your project. So here we go. We got this basic shape material. I am going to duplicate that out. I'm going to call it inner door mat, which is a common shorthand for material. Um, and I'm actually going to pop out the menu over here so I can actually uh, see my entire folder structure for the project here by popping that out. And I don't want to have this new material be an engine content because that's that's a real bummer. It's kind of like down in all of the cruft that is part of default UE4. So let's go ahead and drag that into our top level first person folder right up here. Uh, and I'm going to just move that over. So let's go here. Now it's sitting here. I actually did create this textures folder in our last tutorial, so I could just put it in there. It's probably not a bad idea. I'm going to drag it there. All right, and now I'm going to open this up and I'm going to change the color of this. It's white by default, but I would like to make my door purple. I'm going to I'm going to make it a purple door. So we're going to change the color of that material which we, again, if you missed my last tutorial, we did a lot of that last time. I'm gonna hit apply and save that out. And now, come on UE4, work with me here. All right, great. So now we're gonna go back to our door um, and we are going to assign that material. So if we type in door, there we go. Got that door material, it's nice and purple, I love it. Um, so by the way, a really common thing you want to do with blueprints is you want to compile them. This is basically saving for your blueprint. This is when you put, try to put everything together, all the logic that you've written, all the components that you may or may not have added. And you're basically by hitting the compile button saying, Hey, I'm going to try and cook this dish. Is this good? And, uh, you know, the engine, which is basically the chef here, head chef may look at what you've done and say, mm, no, 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 there's something broken here. You have to fix that before I'm actually going to let this go into your game because otherwise the game is going to crash. So, uh, if you hit compile and then you see errors, you need to fix those errors before your blueprint will actually show up in the game. And you will also get a really ugly looking like bad error component sort of thing that sits here. So you will know if a blueprint has gone bad and then it will tell you uh, in the error messages for the engine how to fix it. So we've created this inner door piece. Um, we are going to make some sidebars for our door. So let's call this sidebar and we are going to squish that down, make it a little bit skinnier and put it right here, right on the side of the store. And let's change that material uh, to just be like base I think what was, what was it called base base color basic shape material I love it let's find that it's just it's white easy the next thing you'll notice is that when you're moving stuff around on the grid here um it's kind of weird like oh I can only snap it to where it's sticking through the purple door or it's like totally floating off in space what we want to do is adjust the grid values so basically you can adjust how um finely grained uh the grid is when you move stuff around so if you go up here to this right here which is the position grid snap value very confusingly named I don't know why um, we want to make it smaller so that we can get more finely grained. So we're going to do this drop down. We're going to pick one. And then if we actually try and move this piece, there you go. We can move it so nicely uh, so that it is not clipping through the purple door. Um, so now we're just going to control C, control V. We made another sidebar. I'm going to put that on the right hand side here. I love it. Look at that. Um, and if you wanted to, if you're so inclined, you could also like make a top bar and you could just rotate it like this. Uh, this is optional, but I'm going to do like a little 90 degree rotation. Oh, geez. OK, back bad. And then I uh, pull this up to the top here. And expand it like that. Look at that. That's a nice looking door right there. Uh, so this is the part that's going to slide up and down. Let's make sure again, hit the compile button. If you see orange, you got to hit compile. That's that's the law. I don't make the law. Um, 
And uh, so now we have a door uh, that we could place in the world. So let's back out here to our map. And if we go up to the top content, which is where we made our door, uh, if you got lost or you made your door in a subfolder, you can always click this content up here and just type in door and it will find your door. There's also some other like default stuff to do with UE4 doors in here, it looks like. I'm not 100% sure what's going on here, but um, we're not using any of that, so I'm not too worried. Uh, we are going to take this door that we just made and just like any other shape, we're gonna click and drag it into our scene. There we go. So we've got a door. Um, and let's hit play. So we have spawned our first instance of the class door. Looks great, but there's just one problem. All right, this door is so tiny. The store is like waist high. We will get no use out of the store. It will block nobody unless we were uh, dog sized. So <laughs> we need to fix that. So um, go ahead and hit escape back out. Uh, we are gonna modify this instance of the door in the world. Uh, the parent class door just has kind of this shape and size to it. Uh, this is gonna be true of all doors, but we can actually modify the size of this instance to be whatever size we want. So let's go ahead and go to the scale tool and we're gonna click on that white center pivot. We're gonna make it like super, super big. So, okay, there we go. Now it's giant. And you'll notice that if we wanted to, we could drag a second door in here, pulling from that class, which is the template for the door. And oh, look, it's small because we only applied that scaling to the instance, not to the class itself. If we went and we actually changed the size of the door in here, it would change the size of all doors everywhere in the game. But we are not doing that. We are just changing the size of the instance. So anything that's pulled from the default class stays exactly the size that it was set to be in that class. So it's probably not a bad idea. If we were if we were building a real video game, we would probably go figure out what the right player height is and everything. And we would make a door that actually fit that player height so that we didn't have to like manually adjust the scale on every single door that we spawned ever for all eternity. Um, and that's probably not a bad idea. But for now, because we're just building the one door, I'm getting lazy. I'm just going to scale it here in the scene. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Um, plus, I like that this allows me to kind of customize how weird looking the door is by scaling it in different ways. So we got this door uh, kind of roughly the shape and size that we want it. Um, unfortunately, it does nothing right now. And as you'll notice, uh, we cannot pass through it. So we need to add some actual game logic to it to make the inner piece go up and down when we get close. So let's back out here. The next thing we're going to do is add something called a trigger volume. So click back into your door. Uh, trigger volumes are, once again, a very fundamental concept in game development. Uh, a trigger volume is basically an invisible shape in the world that just sends a message when the player walks into it so that you can do anything that you would like to do with that knowledge. So for example, um, nearly any cutscene, like if you've ever played a, any really 3D ARPG or action game, you probably walk into a certain point in the level and all of a sudden the camera comes away and flies into this other thing and a cutscene starts. Well, you just walked into a trigger volume and that's why that, that thing turns on. Uh, similarly, you know, you might, uh, all of a sudden, uh, when you, uh, for example, are looting in a battle royale game, you walk near an object, and then all of a sudden you see a prompt to hit a button in order to interact with that object or loot it or put it in your backpack or whatever. Well, you just walked into a trigger volume. So that object in the world has its own trigger volume that's waiting for the player to walk into it. And when it does, it says, okay, player's here. Uh, show them the prompt to actually pick this thing up because I know they're nearby. So that's what we're gonna create here. This time we're gonna go back up here to our add component. And instead of adding a cube, we're going to add what's called a box collision in UE4. So you will see that that spawns. Um, we're not going to name this box. We're going to name it like a uh, check for player trigger or something that is more useful than box because that's helpful to nobody if they're looking at your blueprint and trying to, trying to figure out what you did. So here we go. Uh, as you can see, it's sitting like right here. Um, with trigger volumes, they need to actually take up the amount of space that you would want to check for the player's presence. So like, for example, if we just leave it right here, then the player's not gonna actually walk into this volume until their like face is inside the door. And that's probably not a great player experience. We probably wanna open the door before the player is 
has got their face in the door. Um, and they're probably not going to figure out that that's how they open the door if it's that janky. So let's take this and we're going to scale it up. We're going to make it big. Let's do like this. Let's let's be generous, right? Like we, we don't want the player to root around and have to really work hard to figure out how this door opens and closes. So we're gonna make it bigger than the door itself. And it's gonna extend on both sides because again, we ideally want the player to be able to open this door from both sides. If we wanted it to just be a one-way door, then we could just like put it on this one side and basically say, oh, when the player walks in, then the door opens. But once they go through, they actually cannot enter this volume from the other side. So they actually can't go back. It's a one way door, um, but that's not what we're doing here. So let's go ahead and, and just center it so that they can enter that trigger from either side of the door and then they can open it from both sides. So now that we have our trigger volume, we're gonna actually have to hook up some logic to that volume. So let's go ahead and click on the trigger volume. Over here in the details pane, we're gonna see if we scroll all the way down to events. Um, events are basically just some default things that UE4 gives you out of the box to say, hey, like when certain things happen with this component, you might wanna do something. So we're just gonna give you these for free. Um, and you can, you can always add your own custom events, which we will do in later tutorials. We'll create our own events. But for now, everything we need comes right out of the box, super handy. Um, so what we're gonna do is uh, add an event for this on component begin overlap. Uh, and as you can see, you can actually hover if you would like any of these event names and it will explain to you what happens here. So we can see event called when something starts to overlap this component. For example, a player walking into a trigger. Ah, perfect. That's exactly what we're doing. Thank you, UE4. Let's hit the plus button. And this is gonna take us to the event graph. So again, mullet, business in the front, party in the back, noodles in the back. We are going to the back of this blueprint and we are gonna start touching those noodles. So uh, now we wanna of course hit compile and save. Uh, and so what we're gonna do here is basically, uh, this is an event that UE4 created for us uh, at our own request. And this event is going to fire whenever the player overlaps with check for player trigger. Great. But what do we actually wanna do with that information? I'm so excited because you're about to make your first node in Blueprint. It's a big moment. Um, so the way the blueprints work is they always start from some inciting event, uh, which in this case is this overlap. And then uh, there's a white line of logic that determines where the code goes and it can go through a bunch of different nodes. So in this case, drag off from that little white arrow and we're just gonna type print and find this print string node. Um, and all this does is it will print a string to the bottom of the screen. A string is just obviously a uh, text. Uh, programmers call it string. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, and uh, we're gonna print a message that says hello whenever we go through that trigger volume, just so we know that the overlap is working. By the way, this print string is really helpful. I use it all the time when you're trying to debug whether or not a thing is doing anything, but you don't have an obvious way to make it actually do the thing that you're trying to do. You can print a bunch of strings to say, hey, is this actually firing or not? I'm not 100% sure. Um, and the code will tell you. So we're gonna just print a string that says hello when we go through that trigger. So let's compile that, hit save, hit play. And now when we walk into that, we see hello. You can actually see in the top left of your screen right here on the play window, every time we go through, it's firing hello, hello, hello. So what we wanna do is make sure that when we collide this other actor. So keep in mind, this event is happening from the perspective of the trigger volume. Uh, it's basically saying, okay, well, what was the other actor here that hit me? And, you know, as we discussed before, nearly all blueprints in UE4 boil down to being actors. You can actually see in the top right here what the parent class for something is. Parent class here is actor. Um, the other actor, let's check if that was a first person character, which is if you go out here, you can actually click, you can see that this thing here, which is our player. If you look over here, you can see that it's of type first person character, and it even lets you go edit the first person character blueprint class. If you would like to change some properties of all first person characters, we don't wanna do that, so we're not gonna do that right now, but that's how you would know, hey, like we wanna only check for this thing to collide with the trigger volume. What is this thing? Oh, it's first person character. So going back here, um, and we are going to add this node into the flow of logic. So we're gonna hook up those arrows once again. Uh, and now of course the white line is gonna go through these both of these nodes. Uh, and 
we are doing what's called a cast. Casting is a kind of interesting concept in Unreal. Uh, it is a concept that does exist in other programming languages, but not quite in the same way as it exists in Unreal. Uh, when you cast in Unreal, what you're basically doing is taking an object and then trying to ask a question about, hey, is this object of this type? I usually you would only cast if you believe that it is of that type, um, but you want to make sure. I, and then once you have casted, this node actually spits out that type it, because it's confirmed that, yes, this thing actually is what you think it is. And then you can actually use that object uh, and use some of the specific properties of that object that are specific to the subclass. So keep in mind, remember we talked about parent classes and inheritance, like pets and then cats deriving from from pet uh, actor is it's like that pet class it's super generic um, we don't actually have much on it uh, we can't access very many functions on it it's pretty vanilla but once we've casted this thing to a first person character then it actually spits out hey as a first person character what would you like to do now you have access to more specific functions that you might want to use off that first person character so um, in this case, we're not actually going to do anything with this functionality. We could do many things if, for example, we wanted to fade the player's screen when they walk through a trigger volume, or we wanted to show them a message, or we wanted to sh rumble their camera because they just walked through a trigger volume where there's supposed to be like an earthquake happening. There's all kinds of things we could do once we had confirmed that what actually hit this trigger volume was the player character. But we're not doing that here. All we want out of this cast is confirmation that, yes, a player character walked through the door. Um, if, for example, we were building a game where there were enemies around, right now this door without this cast would trigger when an enemy walked through the volume because it doesn't care who walked through. It just knows that something collided with that volume. Uh, so by adding this cast, we're actually protecting that door and saying, okay, we only want to open this door when a player walks through. So we're going to do something really simple now to check that this is working. Um, we obviously know that we're hitting the trigger volume because we see this. Uh, we saw this hello print string earlier, but let's select that and delete it. And what we're going to do now is just temporarily add some code that deletes that door piece when we get close, just so we know that it's working. So click, take this this to inner door piece here, and click and drag. And what you've just done is created a reference to that inner door piece, which you can then do things to in code. So we are going to take that here and we are going to type in destroy component. It's brutal, but it's what we got to do. So we are going to take that inner door piece, drag off, destroy it, compile, save and hit play. And when we walk up to the door, oh my gosh, it's just gone. This is not great in the long term, of course, because the door does not come back. But if, for example, you wanted to build like an exploding door in a game, um, this might be the type of thing you would do where like, OK, uh, when we when the player gets close to the door, we want to just play an explosion on it. And then we're just going to actually destroy the component entirely so they can freely walk back and forth. We're not going to bother with an opening animation, um, but that's not what we're doing here. We would like to apply a nice kind of slide up and down to the door. So let's just go back in here and we're gonna just delete these couple of nodes now that we know for sure that that check for player trigger actually works. In order to actually make the door slide up and down, we're gonna create what's called a timeline. In UB4, timelines are a type of node that basically allows you to play, as the name implies, uh, a timeline of keyframes uh, doing something, which you can then hook extra logic up to uh, depending on the result of, of what that timeline spits out. So to show you what I mean, let's right click here and we're going to type in timeline and all the way down here, it's going to say add a timeline. Uh, so we're going to name that timeline something like door slide to make it nice and easy. And we would like to play that timeline from the start. So go ahead and hook up that white node to the play from start. Um, but currently, if we click into this timeline, it does nothing. It just opens up this kind of blank, weird, empty window. Uh, if you have ever worked with any 2D animation software or just any kind of like motion graphics or Photoshop or anything that moves, um, you'll be really familiar with the concept of, of keyframing. Uh, again, really common concept in animation. But if you haven't, keyframes are basically just uh, markers of what you would like a specific thing to do at a specific time on a timeline. So in animation, you might say like, okay, well, at this time, I would like the hand position to be here. 
And at this time, it's going to be here. So then when we play those keyframes back and forth, it's going to look like that thing is moving between two positions as time moves on. Uh, here, we're going to go up here to the top and we're going to add a float track. A uh, float, again, as we discussed in our, our last tutorial, is basically just a decimal number. Um, because what we're doing is we're actually, over time, going to animate the height of this door. And that height is tracked by a float value. So we're going to add this float track. And we're going to name this like slide amount. I'm not getting very creative today. Um, so we now have this float timeline track. And if you zoom out, basically this is like if you took algebra in high school and you had to like track numbers over time on a graph uh, to track like build curves uh, and other, again, calculus, like this is just very uh, mathy stuff that then translates out into animation uh, when we hook it up to a door's position over time. So what we're gonna do, uh, let's say that basically the door's position starts at one. Uh, we're going to put right click here and again, just add a little key. That's our first keyframe. Uh, so let's go ahead and make sure that that's right. I kind of eyeballed it, but just to be clear, we're going to go up here, click, click on that little thing and up here on, under time, um, just make sure that time is set to zero and that value is set to be one. So that way it's perfect. So of course, when the time is zero, we want the door's position to be one, which is whatever height it's at right now. Great. We just want it to start there. Um, however, after a certain amount of time, let's say one second. So we're going to go over here on the timeline horizontally because of course the horizontal or X axis here refers to time. Again, if you took high school math, hopefully this looks a little familiar to you. Um, at one second, we want that value to be negative one. We want it to be the inverse of whatever its height is now. So we're going to go all the way down. Again, you can right click here to pan that timeline down if you get lost and we're going to right click here, add a key at one second, we want that position to be negative one. So we're going to add that float value here. And again, just to zero it out, just to make sure we're doing the right thing. When time is one, the value is negative one. Bam. So um, we are going to compile that just to make sure we've got it. And then when we back out here, Aha, look, it's been exposed for us to actually read values from. Very nice. So now we're going to actually make that door slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this inner door piece right here. We're going to drag that off. We're going to get a reference to it. Again, just like we did last time. And we're going to uh, get its relative location. And we're going to set that relative location. So right here. And we want this to uh, change on the update, which is basically as the timeline is playing, every tick, which is like hundreds of times a second, we're gonna send this update event uh, over and over and over again. So this is gonna happen like a billion times. There's also this finished event, which you could do optionally. If for example, you wanted when the door finishes opening, there's like a puff of smoke at the, at the base of the door and you only want that to play once, you could hook that up to the finished part of this timeline. But we're not doing anything like that today. So we'll just hook it up to the update. And when we update, we're going to set its relative location. Uh, and this is a vector. So a vector is basically an x, y, and z smashed together into one value, uh, which determines the new relative location of that door. So um, again, high school math might have been a million years ago for you, but uh, relative and world location uh, are, are different things. So the world location is basically the the actual real value that something is in the world. Like Spain has a, a a world location that is at some certain coordinates. If I were to plug that in, I could go find the center of Spain in real life. Um, but then there's the relative location. So for example, my cell phone has a, a world location. Again, it also has some probably some specific coordinates of where it sits on planet Earth. But its relative location to me is about a foot and a half away. So I, I could either track its world location, um, which is probably very complex, or I could just track its relative location to me, which is what we care about right now, because, you know, I, we're, we're focusing just on this door. And we really just care about how far that inner piece of the door is from the rest of itself. We don't necessarily care about moving it around in the context of the entire game world and all of its various properties. We just care about where this piece is relative to the rest of the door. So we are only changing its relative location. That being said, 
um, we will need to break down this vector into its various components uh, so that we can actually just change the Z value because we don't want to be changing X and Y. This door is not moving like this. It's not moving like this. It's only moving up and down. So we're going to right click on that vector and we are going to split that sucker into three. Go ahead and hit that split struct pin option. Um, so this is another thing to learn. Some pins on nodes can be split. If you right click on them, um, you can split them into something else. So uh, you can usually also recombine if you right click on something like this. There's that recombine option. You can recombine and split at will um, because some pins are actually more complex data that you can break down into their various little subcomponents. So that's what we've done here. Um, you can also sometimes right click and promote variable. Uh, if you have written any code before, um, variables should be pretty familiar to you. If not, we will go into variables in our next lesson. We are going to do things a little bit hackier today. I'm trying to keep it simple if you have no programming background. Uh, so for now, anyway, we've got this slide amount. This is just changing the door Z value, just the up and down. And we just want to plug it into this new location Z. However, because this is only going to spit out a value between negative one and positive one, we actually need to multiply that by the actual height that the door is off of the ground. So again, we found that that inner door piece had a height of 50, and this is going to spit out between one and negative one. So um, we want to drag off, and you can actually type in um, the asterisk key, which is the multiply symbol in, in all programming languages. Uh, you could also, I think, type in multiply uh, and get like a float x float. Uh, but in this case, I like to use asterisk, it's shorter. Uh, we're going to multiply that float by 50. Bam. And what we're going to get off of this is that when this node runs, when we get through this white execution node here, this set relative location is saying, OK, I'm going to set the relative location of this inner door piece. I'm not doing anything to the X. I'm not doing anything to the Y. I'm only changing the Z. Please tell me what I should be setting it to. And then it reads the result of these noodles that were plugged into it. So it says, hey, OK, um, it looks like the Z value is whatever the value of this timeline is right now multiplied by 50. And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to use that data. So in this case, we now want to compile and save. And then if we go back out to our map and we hit play and we walk into the door, we should see some magic happen. OK, but and, and here's a problem. Um, you'll notice a couple of things. Number one, uh, the door doesn't close back up. And number two, that means that we can't actually repeatedly use the door. And by the way, every time we enter this trigger volume, it's going to play that timeline from the start again. So that's not great. And that's not what we want. So we actually need to change the timeline a little bit to make it a little smarter so that it doesn't just keep doing that over and over again. So let's go back into our door blueprint. So there's a few funky things going on here that we still have to debug. Um, number one, if you click in your timeline, you're going to see that its length is set to five seconds long. Um, given that the thing that we're doing is only one second long, this is not great uh, to leave it at five because what it's going to mean is that the timeline just hangs along way longer than it should. And it's not being as responsive. Like it might still be not checking for events for a full three seconds after it's done com done sliding, which is not great. So we're just going to make that one back back out. Um, and number two, we actually have no event for when the player moves away from the door to close it back up again. Uh, so what we probably want to do is go back to this check for player trigger over here, scroll down over here, and just like we added an event for when we begin the overlap, we want to add another event for when the player leaves the trigger and they end the overlap. Uh, so this event is going to be extremely similar to what we did above. In fact, we can actually just drag and copy and paste control C control V all of these nodes down here. Don't forget to hook up your other actor cast here so that this actually succeeds. Um, but instead of playing the timeline from the start, we want to reverse it from the end. In fact, let's give it a name so it's clear. Um, door return, maybe. 
is a good name for that. So we're going to reverse from the end, set relative location. This looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and see how we fare. OK, the door is opening and it closes back up. Great. Look at that. It's a beautiful door. It waits while we're sitting inside the trigger. It does nothing. But as soon as we leave, it closes back up again. So here's the other cool part of this. Um, if you wanted to drag in other instances of this door, because we added all of that logic to the class itself instead of to the actual door instances, they all have that behavior by default. And they will all do the exact same thing as that parent door. Um, if you wanted to, for example, take this door and you wanted to modify it. So let's say we're going to click on this door in the scene. We're not going to edit the actual door class, but we're going to edit the scene. And you wanted to go down to this inner door piece and you wanted to make that material some other color. Like let's, I don't know, it looks like there's some other default materials in this project. So let's set it to this like hover material. You can do that. And now you have two doors that are different sizes that are different colors, but they still use the same underlying class principles to define their behavior. So you don't have to copy and paste the door logic a million times if you want to create a game that has a bunch of doors in it. That's where classes come in handy, and that's the power of Blueprint. So that's all for today's lesson. Uh, we've really just started to scratch the surface with Blueprints. So in our next lesson, we're going to go even deeper. But in the meantime, if you'd like a simple homework assignment, take that door that you just built, take that trigger volume, try sliding it around and making a one-way door and see if you can create a cool maze using just one-way doors and hallways, uh, AKA cubes that have been stretched to be really long like walls. And uh, see if you can create a maze for your friends to solve. Uh, as always, if you have any questions around anything you learned today, please leave them in the comments and otherwise, see you next time.